Hello there, a uh, good day, good noon, and probably a good evening to anyone watching this video. Welcome to General Biology 2 class, first year of the Senior High School STEM strand. We are the eight grouped, composed of John Kylie, Michelle Medalia, Jelian Obra, and yours truly, Romel Salitsena. And we're going to give you a brief and concise presentation, a straightforward explanation, talking all about the immune system of both plants and animals. So let's get through it then. But before that happens, we would like to remind you that the world of the immune system is a very complex and dynamic topic. Thus, we can say that its study is still in progress. There is still a lot more to discover and understand about this intricate and emerging field of study. A lot more unanswered questions we know nothing about. But we, the group 8, are going to introduce to you the basic processes and functions of this system that keeps our body safe and fights away diseases to keep us alive whether you're a plant or an animal, even if we don't really notice it in real time. So here are our learning objectives for today. At the end of this lesson, the learners shall be able to identify the processes and functions of the immune systems of both plants and animals. Since plants and animals do differ from one another, even in their immune systems, varying functions and processes are to be discussed in this video. Second, compare and contrast plants and animal immune systems. We need to be able to compare the two in order for us to fully understand this topic. And lastly, recognize the importance of the immune system for both plants and animals. So why is our immune system that important? Is it because it fights back viruses and bacteria? Well, technically, yes, but there is more to that than just simply killing the germs on or even in our body. In general, we call that germs pathogens, and our immune system is encoded to fight off these intruders. But of course, we must first define what is the immune system. The immune system is the body's defense mechanism against infections, diseases, and foreign substances. A complex network that helps an organism defend itself against a pathogen. It plays a crucial role in maintaining the body's stability, known as homeostasis, ensuring everything stays in balance. So, our immune system is like the military who protects other systems from foreign harm, such as pathogens. It is also pretty much similar to our atmosphere. The Earth's magnetic field protects us from the deadly rays of the sun, ozone layer acting as a greenhouse to trap heat and maintain balance of temperature, which we know as homeostasis, and also the different layers of the atmosphere that also shields us from threats such as cosmic rocks flying in deep space. While this function of the immune system can cause autoimmune diseases, which is a condition from an abnormal immune response to a normal body part. It is where the immune system attacks healthy parts of the body. It is like a betrayal of cells. Relating to this condition, I think I saw something online that when the immune system realizes where our eyes are located, which I think the immune system doesn't know about or is not familiar about the part of the body, it attacks it, thinking our eyes are foreign and a possible threat, which could cause permanent loss of vision, which is quite freaky. Going back, this function of the immune system can also cause immunodeficiencies. One known example of this is HIV or AIDS, which weakens our immune system. Also inflammatory diseases like asthma, even allergies, and cancer. All of which could possibly lead to death. Here are some of the important terms we need to familiarize. Immunity is the ability to resist a particular disease through preventing its development, specifically the pathogen, or by countering its effects. Immunity has a lot of mechanisms and also has different types that we're going to talk about later in this video. While immunology is a science that deals with the immune system and the cell-mediated and numeral aspects of immunity and immune responses. It is the study of the immune system which we humans still have gaps in understanding. A ton of mysteries about it still exist, but it also has major breakthroughs that helped humanity in many ways, such as the development of vaccines and a lot more. We're also going to talk about that later. But why do we need our immune system, you may ask? This is mainly because of pathogens. Pathogens are a specific causative agent of disease in a host. And here are some of the most common examples we know about pathogens. Some can be cellular, while some are not. First is the cellular pathogens, or the living ones. There is the bacteria, which are prokaryotic microorganisms, mostly harmless, but some can cause diseases. Example of this is salmonella. Second one is fungi, eukaryotic organisms with cell walls and a nuclei. A good example of this is ringworm. 
Also, there are parasites, organisms dependent on host for survival. A good example of this one is a tapeworm. And lastly, protist, which are a diverse group of eukaryotic microorganisms. And a good example of this one though is the malaria. Now let's move on to the acellular pathogens or the non-living ones. One example we know is viruses, which are non-living particles that need a host in order to multiply. Viruses are small strands of DNA or RNA molecules. A good and recent example of this one is the COVID-19. And there are also prions, infectious proteins lacking nucleic acids. An example of this one is the Creutzfeldt Jacob disease or the CJD. Now we got that covered, we'll go back to the immune system. The immune system is divided into two main branches, the innate and adaptive immunity. In the innate immunity, it is considered as the first line of defense. It has an immediate response to pathogens, non-specific protection against pathogens through barriers like the skin and inflammatory responses. While in the adaptive immunity, it has a specific response. It recognizes specific pathogens or antigens. Highly specialized, providing targeted and specific long-term protections by creating antibodies and memory cells towards particular pathogens. So, the thing that we should always remember is that the innate immunity is non-specific, whereas the adaptive immunity is. Also, the innate immunity cannot gain any immunological memory, in which is the ability of the immune system to respond more effectively to previously encountered pathogens, unlike the adaptive immunity which is why the adaptive immunity is more advanced and specialized than that of an innate immunity. But we should also be aware that adaptive immunity has two main subdivisions, passive and active immunity. In the passive immunity, it refers to the transfer protection to external sources of antibodies or immune cells. It has immediate protection but is short-term and has no immunological memory. While in the active immunity, it is long-term protection through direct exposure to antigens, stimulating immune response. Though it has delayed protection, it is long-term and has an immunological memory. And each of these immunities has its own subtypes, natural and artificial. In passive immunity, a good natural example of this one is breast milk and placental transfer, due to the fact that it is a mother-to-child relation, unlike the artificial passive immunity that is provided and not made by the body. It is produced in a laboratory and injected into the body. Example of this one is immunoglobulins and antivenom. While in the active immunity, a good natural example of this one is the recovery from certain illnesses. Like when you've experienced having chickenpox once in your lifetime. It means you're immune to it now and cannot experience it twice since your body has adapted. That is what we call immunological memory. It remembers the pathogen or illness and fights back more stronger. While the artificial active immunity is the intentional exposure to antigens. It is like to teach or to train your immune cells to fight these pathogens. Vaccinations and immunizations are some known examples of these ones. And active immunity of adaptive immunity also has two subdivisions of its own, cell-mediated and humoral immunity. In the cell-mediated immunity, T cells, or also known as killer cells, directly attack infected cells, which is why they're called killer cells. Or they can also produce cytokines which are signaling molecules secreted by immune cells that facilitate cell communication to kill infected cells. They can also regulate immune responses and memory cell formation. T cells also signal macrophages who have a crucial role in phagocytosis. They're the ones who eat particles like pathogens. While in the humoral immunity, B cells produce antibodies such as the immunoglobulins that are proteins that neutralizes pathogens to block them from entering a cell. It also facilitates phagocytosis by marking pathogens. Phagocytosis refers to the process of a cell or immune cell to engulf and digest foreign substances and materials such as pathogens. It is also known as cell eating back in our previous lessons about cells last semester. B cells can also activate and signal other T cells to undergo cell-mediated immunity. And here is a diagram made by us so that we can easily understand and identify the different types and branches of each immunity. Take a good look. So now, let us first cover the animal immune system. The animal immune system is a complex defense network protecting against pathogens, injuries, and diseases. It comprises both innate and adaptive immunities. There are three lines of defense in which an animal's immune system operates. And first, 
is the first line of defense, which falls in the innate immunity category. There is the skin, which provides us the very first barrier of immunity. There is also mucous membranes and cilia, which traps and removes pathogens. Mucous membranes cover the respiratory tracts as protection and produces mucus like phlegm in order to be excreted outside. Saliva and stomach acids are considered as chemical barriers that contain enzymes that help break down and also kill pathogens. And now let's move on to the second line of defense which is also a part of the innate immunity or the non-specific category. Number one is the phagocytic leukocytes, those who eat pathogens. There are also inflammatory responses and fevers that are both immunity responses that activates immune cells. So when having these two, it is a sign that your immune system is fighting for you. And lastly, antimicrobial proteins helps enhance phagocytosis and break down the structure of pathogens, more like a complement system which works together with the immune system for enhanced effectivity. And finally, the third line of defense, which now falls in the adaptive immunity or the specific category. First, we have lymphocytes, a type of white blood cells such as T and B cells. They also have antibodies that helps neutralize pathogens. And a good example of this one is the immunoglobulins. And lastly, how can we forget about memory cells? There are memory T cells and memory B cells that provide lasting protection, which means that this third line of defense has a process in which immunological memory takes a huge part and role for the system's effectiveness. Now, we're done with a brief overview of the animal immune system. Let's move on to the plant immune system. The plant immune system is another complex network of defense mechanisms to protect from pathogens, pests, and even environmental factors. One key distinction of a plant's immune system is that it only has an innate immune system unlike the animal immune system that has an extra adaptive immune system. It doesn't have an adaptive immune system but it still has the complexity as the animal immune system who has one. The plant immune system has two different recognition systems that initiate plant immunity. First, we have Pattern Triggered Immunity or PTI. Plant cell surface receptors or known as Pattern Recognition Receptors or PRRs detect pathogen-associated molecular patterns or PAMPs to trigger immune responses. PTI provides initial protection against pathogens and prepares the plant for more enhanced defense responses. Secondly, the Effector Triggered Immunity or the ETI. Resistance proteins like the nucleotide binding leucine which repeat or the NBLRR detect effector molecules secreted by pathogens which signals the ETI reaction and results to a hypersensitive response wherein an oxidative burst produces reactive oxygen species or ROS, thereby triggers rapid cell death or what we know as apoptosis, isolating the pathogens to disintegrate them. ETI recognizes specific pathogen effectors that are typically more stronger and faster than PTI responses that usually detect general PAMPs or pathogen-associated molecular patterns rather than specific ones. To give comparison, here is a Venn diagram representing the main differences and similarities of the immune systems of both plants and animals. In plants, they are known to lack an adaptive immune system, and they also lack mobile immune cells, and has immune responses that are occurring within individual cells, while in animals, they possess an adaptive immune system. They are more complex with multiple cell types and organs. And also, they have specialized immune cells. With their similarities, they both possess an innate immune system. They both recognize and generate protection against pathogens and produce antimicrobial molecules. Summing up everything that has been stated, the immune system plays a critical role in maintaining the health and well-being of both plants and animals. Moreover, the immune system drives adaptation and species diversification, maintaining ecological balance. Here are the references our group based on, and that would be everything covered for today. Again, this is Romel Salesena with my fellow groupmates Jelly Nobra, Michelle Medalia, and John Kalyi. Together, we are the group 8, discussing and giving a brief overview of the plant and animal immune system. We hope you've learned something for today, and here, I shall say... Adiós.